Welcome back to our final video for lecture 34 in our series. And I want to talk about how arc length can be interacted with a polar curve. How do you find the length of a polar curve? Well, we're going to use the arc length formula that we saw before, um, s equals the integral of ds, where we're using the fact that ds is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. Now, when we dealt with parametric functions, we showed that we can modify this for a parametric setting. And we do have a parametric setting, x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. And so if we take derivatives of these things appropriately, we can factor out a d theta. And so factor out the d theta, you're gonna get the integral of the square root of dx over d theta squared plus dy over d theta squared. That's a theta, believe me on that one. And then there's a d theta on the outside. So we can adapt this for, for a d theta. We just have to take the derivative of x with respect to theta and the derivative of y with respect to theta. Now remember, since r is itself a function of theta, the derivative of r with respect to theta will be involved here. And so taking the derivatives of x and y with respect to theta will give the following. Uh, the derivative of x, since we have r times cosine, we need to use the product rule. In which case, we're going to get an r prime times cosine theta plus, I guess I should say minus, minus r times sine theta. That's what happens when you take dx over d theta squared. Then if you do that for, for dy over d theta, you're going to get an r prime sine theta, and you're going to get plus r times cosine theta, like so. Now, this is just the derivatives of those functions with respect to theta. This all sits inside of the d theta, or the square root. Now you have to foil these things out. This, it might seem complicated, but this is actually a, a saving grace for us. When you foil out the first one, you're going to get r prime squared. And like usual, r prime here is short for dr over d theta. So you're going to get an r prime squared cosine squared theta. You're going to get a minus 2 r prime r cosine sine. Uh, and then you're going to get a positive r squared sine squared theta. Sounds like a lot, but that's just the first one foiled out. The next one foiled out, uh, you're going to get some stuff that's strikingly similar. You're going to get an r prime squared sine squared. You're going to get a positive 2r prime r uh, sine theta, cosine theta. And then lastly, you're going to get an r, an r squared cosine squared theta. This is the second piece. Now this all sits in, inside of a square root and there's a d theta associated to that. Now there's gonna be some nice combinations going on here. So notice some things. So if you take the first one, r prime squared, cosine squared, r prime squared, sine squared. Oh, I forgot to write, this, write the square there. By the Pythagorean identity, those will combine just to be an r prime squared because uh, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. For the next one, you have a negative two r prime r cosine theta sine theta. You also have a positive two r prime r sine theta cosine theta. When those add together, they're just gonna cancel out. And then lastly, you're going to get a r squared sine squared, an r squared cosine squared, sine squared plus cosine squared is again one. Those will combine together just to be an r squared. This sits inside the square root. You're integrating with respect to theta. And voila, the arc length formula actually simplifies very nicely for the polar form. The arc length of a polar curve is going to be the integral of the square root of, oops, sorry, that was the original one. Uh, let's see, I think I have it hidden somewhere on the next slide, perhaps. Here we go. The or the integral, the, the, the arc length is going to be the integral of the square root of the derivative of r squared plus r squared d theta. This is a nice formula. We derived it using parametric equations, but this one's probably worth memorizing or writing in a very convenient place. So if we want to find the circumference of a cardioid, right? Remember the cardioid um, is this lima bean like shape, the limonoid, uh, that's not a word, I just made it up, I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 we want to find the, the circumference of a cardioid. How far around is it once? So to find the arc length, we have to integrate this thing. If we want to get the circumference, we have to do one rotation around the cardioid. So we'd go from zero to two pi. Uh, which is what we could do right there. Now, for reasons that'll be a little bit clearer later, I actually don't wanna do zero to two pi, because zero to two pi would be going from this point all the way around once, uh, which is fine, 
0 and 2 pi. What I actually instead want to do is I want to go from this point right here. Uh, so this would be negative pi halves to 3 pi halves. So that's actually the direction we're going to go. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it's going to lead to a slightly easier integral. So a little bit of foresight can be helpful in that regard. And I'll tell you in a moment just why we're doing that. Uh, so by the formula we have, we have to take the square root of r prime squared. So take the derivative of 1 plus sine theta with respect to theta. That's going to be a cosine theta. We're squaring that. And then we have to square r, which is 1 plus sine theta, like so d theta. So the reason that we wanted to go from negative pi halves to 3 pi halves is to utilize symmetry, right? Um, if you cut along the y-axis, the cardioid symmetric with respect to that. So the circumference of half of it gives you exactly half of the circumference. So we're actually going to simplify um, our calculation. We're going to do s is equal to 2 times the integral from negative pi halves to pi halves. So that's sort of a simplification we got. We don't have a line of symmetry that goes through 0, and which is why we stepped away from it. Symmetry is a great thing when you can find it and you should use it. Now, looking inside of the radical here, we have a cosine squared. Foil out the 1 plus sine squared. You're going to get 1 plus 2 sine theta plus sine squared theta. And this is all, all d theta. The cosine squared combines with the sine squared to give us a 1. So that's equal to a 1, for which we can then add that 1 with the 1 that's already there. So we get 1 plus 1, which is 2. So what we're looking at now, we have two times the integral from negative pi halves to pi halves. We have the square root of 2 plus 2 sine theta, d theta. And so now we have to make a judgment on how are we going to proceed from here. Well, you could factor out the 2 um, that's inside of the radical. You get 2 times the square root of 2 as you integrate from negative pi halves to pi halves. Take the square root of 1 plus sine theta here, d theta. Now this kind of just kicks the can down the road a little bit. We still have to deal with this square root of 1 plus sine theta. And there are some options. We could try some type of trigonometric substitution, but it's already a trig function. That seems like it'd have limited benefit. We could try some type of rationalizing substitution. Um, that would also work, but it turns out that really the best technique for us is just to use the right trig identity. That's always the thing for us. Um, if we were to take the square root of 1 minus sine theta, that's actually something we really want on the top. You have to divide by it to compensate for it. And so notice what happens here if we do this. If you times by the square root of 1 minus sine theta on the top, on the top, we end up with, when you FOIL all that thing out, you're going to get the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta, d theta. You get this on the bottom. How did this help at all? Well, notice 1 minus sine squared is the same thing as a cosine squared. And the square root of a cosine squared gives you a cosine. And so what you see here, this 2 root 2 integral from negative pi halves to pi halves, you're going to end up with a cosine theta d theta over the square root of 1 minus sine theta. And so the reason why this is such a nice move here is because now we're in a situation where u substitution um, is going to save us here. And so that again, with a trig identity, the u substitution makes this a lot cleaner. Take u to be 1 minus sine theta, then du equals minus cosine theta d theta. We'll put a negative sign to compensate for that. Um, since we're doing u substitution, we'll switch the bounds. Theta will switch to u. So you have pi halves and negative pi halves. If you, stuck, if you stick pi halves in for theta, you're going to get 1 minus 1, which is a 0. When you stick in negative pi halves, uh, you should get 1 minus a negative 1, which is a 2. Um, that puts things in upside down order, but since there's a negative sign, we can correct that by switching the order. And we're going to end up with 2 root 2, the integral from 0 to 2. And then we end up with u to the negative 1 half d theta. Woo! Isn't that awesome? Um, the right u substitution can always save us. And so by the power rule, we end up with, uh, well, the power will go up by 1. Uh, so we're going to get u to the 1 half power. We have to divide by 1 half. Uh, but really, dividing by 1 half is the same thing as just timesing by 
2. And then we have to go from 0 to 2 right here. So we end up with 2 times 2, which is 4. 4 times the square root of 2. And we're going to get the square root of 2 minus the square root of 0. In the end, we end up with 8. And I really like this one here because you come back to the original problem. We want to find the circumference of a cardioid. A cardioid is kind of like a, a like a like a, it's a circle, but it got stabbed, right? It has this cusp in it uh, because someone distorted the circle. And while the circumference of a circle is going to be two pi r, the the circumference for this cardioid we ended up with an eight. There's no pi in the answer, um, which seems so bizarre given how there's there's it's round, there's curvature, there's trigonometry. Where is the pi? Uh, I guess someone ate it. I guess. Haha. <laughs> I know that's a horrible pun. I know, but. Someone ate the pie. That, that's the final answer here. And that also brings us to the end of lecture 34 on our discussion on polar functions and calculus of polar functions. So this is great. Um, what, what we're going to do in the next lecture 35, we're going to start our final unit of this series, which will be on sequences and series. This will correspond to chapter 11 of James Stewart's calculus textbook. It's kind of appropriate to end a semester into course with chapter 11. That's where many businesses end their lives, isn't it? And we'll take a look at that next time. So stay tuned for those. Um, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions on any of these videos you've ever seen, please, please, please post your questions in the comments below. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, if you do like this video, please, uh, you know, up click that like button for us and, you know, feel free to subscribe so you get more updates about videos like this in the future. And I will see you next time. See you everyone. Bye.